Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our webinar on teacher well-being and how to manage um, the consequences of a pandemic that we are currently living through COVID-19. My name is Anja Philipp. I work at the School of Education at the University of KwaZulu-Natal and my research background is in teacher well-being with a particular focus on avoiding teacher stress, avoiding teacher burnout and factors related to this. I have been um, in the lucky position and the uh, honored position to um, um, invite the people that you're seeing here today and I have the honor of guiding you through this afternoon's program on behalf of the University of Pazuno Natal and particularly the College of Humanities and the School of Education of the University of KwaZulu Natal. Allow me to uh, spend a few moments just to uh, um, alert you to our program for this afternoon, and I will also introduce our panelists to you. For that, I will share my screen with you now just to give you an overview over what we are going to do um, in this webinar that um, you are now all joining, and I'm very happy to see that this webinar has created such a large response. We have over 500 um, uh, messages of people interested in this webinar, which is uh, quite a wonderful thing, and it shows how relevant and how interesting this webinar is. And um, you will shortly hear from our five presenters for this afternoon. And you can see that we have a range of um, different presenters from different contexts and with different backgrounds. And it's quite exciting for me to guide you through this program. Um, we will hear from these presenters and I'll introduce them to you just now. And at the end of today's sessions, session, there will be a discussion where we will be responding to your questions and your comments. So please, if you have questions on the webinar and on the presentations, uh, post them to us by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom um, program. And we will be able to monitor this and um, we'll res respond to your questions the best possible way. As I said, I would first like to take a few minutes to introduce you to our presenters of today. Our first presenter is Dr. Rebecca Colley. She's a DECRA Fellow and Scientia Senior Lecturer in Education Psychology at the University of New South Wales in Australia. Her research focuses on motivation, well-being and socio-emotional development of um, employees and teachers in particular. She examines antecedents and outcomes of such factors and develops conceptual models around this. Her research has been published um, quite extensively, as you can see here, and I would like to highlight a recently published co-edited book on the social and emotional learning in Australia and the Asia Pacific. She has received awards for her outstanding work, including the Outstanding Early Career Scholar Award from the um, Division C of the American Educational Research Association. She is an Australian Research Council DECRA Fellow for her work on research, for her research on teacher well-being. She's also an associate editor of the Journal of Educational Psychology and an editorial board member of quite a, a number of renowned journals in this field. Please note that Rebecca Colley is located in Australia. So um, due to the time difference that we have with Australia, it's already in the middle of the night there for her, she cannot join us live. Please understand that, but she has sent a pre-recorded input she made particularly for our webinar where she summarizes her research and gives us her insights into this highly relevant topic. Our next presenter is Miriam Arnold. She's a psychologist like I am by training. She's um, studied at the Universities of Ulm and the University of Mainz and currently works at the Leibniz Institute for Resilience Research. Her research focuses on work in organizational psychology with a particular um, emphasis on leadership and mental health in schools, which makes her an excellent contributor to our panel to, uh, this afternoon. She's part of a project called Creating Resilience in Educational Contexts. Um, and as part of that project, a longitudinal, a longitudinal study was conducted with quite a large number of te uh, teachers. Today, she will be presenting some um, research from a follow-up questionnaire on the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the well-being of teachers and principals, which I'm very much looking forward to, and I'm sure you do as well. 
Our next presenter is Leslie Wood. Um, professor Wood is a research professor at um, um, the uh, Northwest University and here in South Africa. She's the director of the research niche area community-based educational research. She's an NRF-rated researcher and is very renowned in her field. And her interests focus on researching participatory ways to facilitate psychosocial wellness in, very, in various educational communities. She's internationally recognized for her work, has published extensively on these topics, and also received awards um, like the honorary doctorate by the Moravian College in Pennsylvania, USA. I'm very happy to have her on board and to share her experience with us this afternoon. Also, when you look into your program, you see that we are not only joined by these renowned researchers, we are also joined by the people who actually work um, as principal or as a teacher under COVID-19 conditions every day in their schools. And I'm very happy to also have them here as uh, panelists in to, um, this afternoon's webinar. And um, first of all, I would like to introduce you to Mr. Terry, Mr. Terry Mdluli, who has been a teacher at different high schools and a deputy or acting principal at a technical high school. And he's currently the principal of a specific high school here in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. He has various uh, academic qualifications and is currently um, conducting his PhD work at the School of Education at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And his work focuses on emotional regulation of teachers. And uh, that has only influenced, has also influenced his talk this afternoon. And we're looking forward to hearing more from him about this. And we are also, uh, I'm also very happy to have Mrs. Nzimande in our uh, group of panelists this afternoon. She's a teacher at a primary school and she teaches uh, different subjects, as you can see here. She's involved in various school committees. And um, she's also uh, um, include. Uh, she's also heading the COVID nineteen um, committee at her particular school. You can see that she's engaged in various ways, and um, she's also um, she also has uh, different academic qualifications. She's currently enrolled in the Masters of Education Research Study at the School of Education at UKZN. With that, um, you can see that we have um, quite a range of interesting panelists here this afternoon, and you will hear from them shortly. Before you get to hear the interesting inputs, however, allow me to make a few introductory remarks just to set the stage for our webinar this afternoon. And uh, to set the stage, I would like to share the following with you. When you look at this graph here that has been published recently, um, by the Global Education Initiative um, at Harvard University and the OECD, you can see some interesting results that have come forward. Here, um, a quite a large number of respondents from 98 different countries have been asked which topics they would prioritize now um, facing a crisis like COVID-19 in the educational field. And it's very interesting to note that the insurance of the well-being of teachers is quite high at the top of this list. And you can see that a majority of the respondents see this as at least somewhat critical, if not very critical, for the field of education, that we actually focus on the insurance of the, the well-being of teachers. This just highlights the importance of our webinar today, but I'm sure you are aware of this because you expressed interest in it and we are, we are very happy to have you here as um, audience this afternoon. Before we actually get to hear more about the well-being of teachers, allow me to kind of set the stage in another way. And that is by giving you some kind of um, insight into how we all define well-being here as panelists in this webinar this afternoon. And for us, well-being is not only to avoid um, the burnout or stress of teachers, burnout as a form of being emotionally exhausted by one's work and uh, becoming cynical about one's work. It's also about fostering the actual positive aspects of work and positive feelings related to work. And you can see that well-being can take on different forms and this is just a, um, a brief summary of different well-being related aspects. You can see that well-being is also established through being committed to one's work, being committed to one's school, 
by being engaged in one's work, by showing dedication or vigor, by being proactive uh, in the work context and taking charge for initiatives, which is very important now also during COVID-19 um, conditions. It's also about showing um, um, organizational citizenship behaviors, behaviors that are relevant for um, teaching and learning in the schools and beyond. And um, there's also another aspect of well-being that one of our presenters will be highlighting, and that is a very holistic view of well-being of teachers. And that relates to uh, positive emotion of teachers, um, the engagement of teachers, relationships teachers have, the kind of um, um, mastery experiences or meaning experiences they have, as well as the accomplishment that teachers experience. So the PERMA model also plays a role. These are just some readings for those of you who are interested to read further. So what you can see here are all different aspects of well-being that we are looking into this afternoon and that our different panelists will be relating to. And when we speak about well-being, we also speak about the idea, as I said, not only to look at what kind of demands teachers are facing that may lead to strain or burnout or stress, and how we can address this. For example, through increasing the resources they have in their work environment, which can reduce strain and which can increase their well-being. But we're also going to focus on personal resources of teachers and which kind of personal resources we can foster so that teachers remain well in their profession, even under situations of crisis, which we are currently experiencing with COVID-19. Please allow me a last summarizing word on this, just to give you an overview, um, a very brief overview, that's certainly not exhausting about what research has previously looked at when we talk about demands or resources of teachers. And you can see that research has previously looked at mental and emotional and physical aspects of the work environment, um, which can be counterbalanced by resources through support from the work environment, through autonomy provided in the work environment or feedback, but also through personal resources. But this is just a brief summary just to set the stage of what research has looked at previously. But now we are living in, quite different, um, in a quite different situation and under quite different conditions. And that means that uh, there is a real need to look into <coughs> demands and um, teachers are facing at the moment under COVID-19 and how we can help them, which resources we can foster to counterbalance those. And our panelists this afternoon have prepared inputs for you to actually um, give their insights into this highly relevant and highly interesting field. Um, and I'm happy to now give the stage to our panelists so that we can learn more about this from them. As I had said previously, our first presenter for this afternoon cannot join us live. Um, Dr. Rebecca Colley is located in Australia and has sent me her input for this afternoon. So please allow me to share that with you now so that you can hear her summary and her insight into this topic. So with that, I give the stage to Dr. Rebecca Colley who has uh, shared this input with me. Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca Colley and I'm a researcher in the area of educational psychology at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. And I conduct research broadly in the areas of motivation and well-being, both among students and teachers. Uh, and a major part of that is looking at well-being among teachers, which is the focus of today's talk. And so the, the research that I've conducted with my colleagues over the past few years has really focused on what we would call job resources, uh, which are factors that are supportive of teacher wellbeing, alongside job demands, which are factors that are detrimental for teacher wellbeing. And so in this research, we found that there are you know, particular job resources like social support or positive teacher-student relationships that help teachers to experience lower stress um, and greater wellbeing at work. Uh, whereas there are other factors, uh, job demands like work, high workload or disruptive student behaviour that are associated with lower teacher wellbeing and greater stress and burnout. Now we all know that teaching is a very rewarding profession, but it's also challenging given that there are so many different demands that teachers face in their work. Now, what's really nice about looking at job resources and job demands is that we see that there are 
uh, the job resources actually play a really important role in mitigating or reducing the detrimental effect of job demands. So let me give you an example. If a teacher has a really high workload, that's a job demand, and that's typically linked with lower wellbeing. However, if that same teacher has a really good supportive network um, at school, have really engaged students, their positive relationships with colleagues, then that helps to offset the detrimental impact of that high workload and teachers' wellbeing actually typically doesn't suffer. In fact, it can actually be higher. And so this is a lot of what I study. Um, and today I'm going to talk about teacher wellbeing, but specifically um, in relation to COVID-19. And so when it comes to COVID-19, uh, this pandemic has brought on many changes across the whole world and teachers aren't immune to those changes. I like to think of uh, those changes in terms of adversity and uncertainty. So let's start with adversity. As we all know, at the beginning of this pandemic, teachers from across the globe suddenly underwent a rapid shift from in-person teaching to face-to-face -face teaching. And this came with a lot of challenges. Uh, changing the content of the syllabus, uh, changing the activities and how they're administered to students, actually being able to reach students if they don't have access online or they're hard to get in touch with. Differentiating learning for different students is, is a lot harder when they're learning remotely. And so teachers faced this you know, great challenge when it came to shifting the type of teaching that they were doing. Um, and this is, a, this is a bit of adversity for teachers. And so uh, this, in one way, created a massive workload for teachers, and many teachers are still experiencing that workload um, because they're teaching some students remotely and some students in person. And so that's this you know, rapid shift as is really underlies this adversity that teachers are experiencing now as a result of COVID-19 that wasn't perhaps there before this pandemic began. And then we also have uncertainty. And so uncertainty relates to the fact that we don't know actually what is going to happen over the next few years relating to this uh, pandemic. We hope for a vaccine. We don't know when it will come. And that, that sense of not knowing uh, is, is can create a lot of anxiety among individuals. There's also that sense of um, uncertainty regarding our own health, our family's health, and our students' health. Um, and then their mental health and their well-being as well. So there's a lot of uncertainty around this pandemic, and I think that also has an impact on teachers' well-being. And so those concerns, those anxieties, the stress from the workload are some short-term impacts on well-being that teachers are experiencing right now. But there are also uh, longer-term impacts on well-being that are likely to occur. Now, we haven't experienced a pandemic like this in living memory across the whole globe, but research looking at other educational disruptions provides some insight into what types of well-being uh, implications there are for teachers over the longer term. And so a couple of years ago in Christchurch, New Zealand, there was a major earthquake, as many of you will be aware. Um, and this disrupted schooling for students in that area. Um, and then when they did return to school, uh, teachers worked very hard to get the students back up to uh, what their learning should be at despite the break. Um, and researchers from New Zealand have shown that this uh, was associated with greater burnout, actually, greater burnout among these teachers, um, which I think is understandable because if you're working really hard uh, to manage just the fact that there's been a major um, earthquake and then on top of that you're working really hard to make sure that your students are still learning over the time so they can keep up with the rest of the students in, in the country uh, this will take its toll over time and so we may see the same thing for teachers i know uh, teachers across the world are working very very hard uh, to ensure that their students' education isn't interrupted or is to minimise the interruptions to their students' education. And that is uh, that can be exhausting, which is a, a, you know, a major part of the definition for burnout. And so we discuss some of the short and longer term impacts on teacher wellbeing that are likely to occur as a result of COVID-19. And so knowing all that, a very important question is, what can be done to support teachers' wellbeing? And I'm going to start by looking at some strategies that teachers can use themselves. And these are strategies that I've conducted research on or that are supported in the broader literature. And the first of these is social support. So in some of our research, we've shown that teachers who experience more positive relationships with their students and their colleagues uh, report greater wellbeing at work, but also greater wellbeing in their general life. And so having this social support network is really important. It's particularly important during this time of COVID when we may be physically distancing from friends and colleagues. And so having ways to 
access uh, and use our support network is really important. That could be through uh, having a chat with a friend on Zoom. It could be having a phone call with family. It could also be, you know, taking time to build more positive relationships with students. Uh, and it, if, if that's possible, of course, and it may also involve, um, you know, having an informal mentor at work who you can chat to or vent with. And this may be someone at a different school. It may be someone who is a teacher like you and who understands what you're experiencing. Really building and making use of our social support networks at this time is really important. Time and time again, studies have shown just how important social support is for wellbeing. The second strategy is psychological detachment, and this basically means switching off. And so we know from research that when people, when employees are able to switch off from work, this is linked with greater wellbeing. Now it's really important that when we switch off, we're actually switching off. We're not thinking about work. So many teachers uh, in Australia, and I'm sure it's the same in South Africa, work more hours per week than what is uh, at school time. And so teachers are often worrying about students, thinking about students marking assessments, and this can mean that they're working uh, a lot later in the evenings. It can mean that it's hard to switch off. Now, if we are reading a book, but we're actually sitting there and thinking about our work and thinking about our students, that's not switching off. So it's really important that we find something that can really distract us and, and help us to switch off from work. So what could this look like? It could be anything that works for you, whether it's exercise, catching up with friends, watching TV, reading a book, volunteering, whatever it is that helps you get out of your head uh, around work and so that you can really switch off. And I think this is actually particularly important during COVID-19, uh, given that there are constant news reports, constant media reports about uh, the situation. And so having time to switch off from work, but also uh, the pandemic is probably really important for our wellbeing at this time. The last uh, strategy I want to talk about is mindfulness. And so there's a really uh, growing body of literature looking at mindfulness and, and its links with wellbeing. And so there are many different uh, free applications online that individuals can use to uh, do mindfulness activities. Um, these take many different forms, so you can probably find something that you're comfortable with and that works for you. Uh, and it can be really helpful uh, to, you know, slow your brain down before you go to sleep and have a, a, deep, a good deep sleep that, you know, could be really important for our well-being and our physical health as well. So those are just some strategies that teachers can use to support their own well-being. But at the same time, I think it's really important to highlight that the onus isn't just on teachers to support their own well-being. It's important that school systems and schools are doing the best that they can as well. And one factor that we've looked at in our research uh, is principal support. Uh, more specifically, we've looked at what is called autonomy supportive leadership practices. And these uh, involve school leadership supporting teachers' empowerment and autonomy, trusting in teachers' ability and professionalism, and providing teachers with choices in how they undertake their work. Essentially, it means principles of supporting teachers' self-initiation and self-empowerment. And what we found in study after study is that when teachers perceive their principles to be autonomy supportive, this is linked with greater well-being and lower burnout. And in some preliminary data that I've uh, been analysing uh, that I collected during the first wave of COVID-19 here in Australia, uh, it's confirming the importance of this type of principal support. Uh, and it was linked with greater wellbeing among teachers during this pandemic. So what can schools do to, to be autonomy supportive? What can school leaders, and this isn't just principals, this is also other leaders in a school. Well, we've uh, got some suggestions in our work and there's several studies that we've looked at this. And so this can involve things like listening, really listening to teachers' perspectives, seeking input in decision-making from teachers, encouraging teacher self-initiation, and providing rationales for the purposes of work tasks that teachers are required to undertake. This uh, idea of autonomy supportive leadership actually stems from self-determination theory. And there's a great many uh, studies out there showing how important this is in the classroom, um, but also for teachers across the school as well. And so that's something that I hope schools and principals can take away uh, to support teacher wellbeing. Of course, it's also important that principals' wellbeing is supported at this time as well. And so I'd like to end there by saying thanks for your attention. Um, the studies that I've talked about today are available for free on 
ResearchGate, if you search my name, Rebecca Colley, you'll find uh, the studies that I have freely accessible there. Um, and I'm also on Twitter if you're interested in following uh, for research updates. My Twitter profile name is Rebecca J. Colley. Thanks very much. Have a lovely day. See you. Sorry, typical error, I was still muted. I'm sorry about this. Um, I hope you enjoyed this input as much as I did. And I would uh, like to express to you that Rebecca Colley had contacted me earlier just to express um, that um, she's very happy to be able to be in this panel and uh, that um, you're more than welcome to contact her through the channels that she has made available to you. And with that, I would like to come to our next presenter for this afternoon, Miriam Arnold. And I think the two presentations link very nicely. And we are now going to look into the, some aspects that Rebecca Colley has raised on a more general level in a lot more detail now. So please, over to you, Miriam. We are very much looking forward to your input and to having you here. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and the invitation to take part in this um, panel. I will try to share my presentation now. Um, in my presentation, I will focus on the changes um, the pandemic brought with it for teachers and the role that leadership and resilience can play in this. I will first quickly talk about the situation during COVID-19 in Germany as a background to the data I'm presenting. And um, I will show you how the school system was affected by the pandemic in Germany. Then I will show you some um, results of a study we conducted during the shutdown of schools. These include information on how schools had to adapt and how the communication among colleagues and with pupils was maintained. Moreover, I can show you some results of the changes in resources and demands at the workplace that occurred. I then speak about, about the role of leadership um, and resilience during the crisis. The um, corona situation in Germany started end of January. We had the first cases in Germany. Um, Mid-March, we had really strict restrictions where the schools um, fully closed. Um, and we then had, starting begin April, initial easing of the corona measures. So the first schools um, could reopen, but only step by step we have um, we only had graduation classes back then, um, and now since begin May, all other classes already uh, also could restart, but only for a few hours a day or only one day a week for a pupil, and only in small groups. We conducted a study among teachers and principals, um, as Professor Philip already said, um, in the school year of 2018 and 19. Um, and now during the pandemic, we could contact these teachers and participants and ask them to take part in another questionnaire on the situation of teachers and principals during the COVID-19 pandemic. 288 people took part and I can now show you some preliminary results of the survey. So our first question was what uh, were the tasks of two teachers during the uh, that schools were closed. We found that the most prevalent task during the shutdown was that uh, teachers actually provided online lessons for pupils. Um, they also had to prepare lessons at home or do some other administrative tasks at home. We found that only one third of um, teachers had to provide emergency, emergency child care at school or be at school for other tasks. Since online uh, lessons were the most prevalent task, we also asked the teachers um, how they rate their own competency concerning digital, digital teaching. And what we find there is that there are big differences in this area. Half of the survey teachers tell us that their competencies are rather low or very low, while only 17% of the teachers feel that their competencies are high. We find the same pattern for the support of the school concerning digital teaching. And 
interesting pattern emerges when we look at well-being of the teachers as an outcome. Teachers who have a higher competency in digital teaching report being more engaged uh, at their work. On the other hand, if support by the school is rather high, this decreases the emotional exhaustion, so the feeling of burnout of teachers. Overall, teachers seem to use email as main communication method um, with their pupils. The, uh, half of the teachers also um, contacted their pupils via phone. The learning materials were also delivered via email pr primary, um, but also via web platforms. We also looked at the communication with, with the principals. This was also mainly via email, but also sometimes via phone. And the communication with colleagues was also mainly via email and rather often 80% of the teachers also um, had phone calls with other, other teachers at their school. Next, we looked at the working conditions of teachers and principals during the COVID-19 um, times. What we find um, is that most working conditions of teachers remain stable. However, we find that um, there is a decrease in two stresses at work. These are emotional demands and real conflict. So um, during the time of the COVID-19 lockdowns, um, teachers report on less emotional demands and less um, real conflict than in a normal school year. On the other hand, we have a slight tendency to um, role ambiguity as increasing stressor. When looking at the working conditions of principles, we find some more changes. We see that um, the possibility to um, use supervision with other principals or professionals and external support um, as resources are growing during the pandemic, while role ambiguity for principals seems to increase. So um, we wanted to show or look at what role leadership and resilience could play during this pandemic. The literature on leadership in crisis suggests that um, quality of communication is one very important um, aspect. So um, also participative leadership behavior um, when, when leaders involve their followers in the decision process is beneficial. On the other hand, directive leadership behavior where the leader decides on the next steps um, can also be helpful. Both, both aspects, participative and directive leadership can be helpful. Sometimes quick actions are needed and it's good as a leader to be directive but uh, during the crisis, the participa participation of the team and an ongoing communication are really important. Another aspect of leadership that could be interesting during crisis is self-sacrificial leadership behavior. This is a, an ethical form of leadership behavior where leaders often forego personal interests and highlight the mission and purpose of the group. This a form of leadership behavior has positive effects on the well-being of followers under normal conditions. Therefore, we um, assume that it might also help during a crisis. The same holds for transformational leadership. So um, leadership behavior where the leader works with the team in creating a vision, identify, identifying needed change, being inspirational, and um, individually consider the followers. We added two aspects of health-oriented uh, leadership. These are value of health and health awareness. Um, value of health meaning that the leader attaches uh, great importance to health issues and health awareness meaning that leaders recognize when their followers are stressed, so um, when the teachers are stressed and why this appears. So in our sample, these forms of leadership um, where we're actually present, we have high values for quality of communication of um, principles, high values for self-sacrificial leadership, transformational leadership, and for the value of health. However, participative and directive leadership uh, behaviors are rather low, as well as health awareness. We next looked at the 
relationship of these leadership behaviors with well-being. What we find there is that transformational leadership as well as participative leadership behavior seem to enhance work engagement of the teachers and uh, a great awareness of the principle for health topics reduces emotional exhaustion in teachers. On the other hand, we find that directive leadership behavior enhances emotional exhaustion. So it is more reasonable to include the teachers at the school in the decision process and to transparently inform them about changes rather than to be directive and make own decisions as principal and only communicate the results. Last aspect I want to talk about is resilience. Resilience, um, we operationalize it here as team resilience with the aspects robustness, agility, and integrity. Robustness means the capacity to resist the crisis. Agility means the adaptation of a school um, to the changing circumstances during a crisis. And integrity means the closeness of team members with their team or school in this case. What we find there is that all three aspects of team resilience are rather high in our sample. And um, we also find positive um, effects on well-being of teachers. So if the integrity um, of school resilience is high, the teachers report on higher work engagement. And as agility of the school is high, um, they report on lower emotional exhaustion. And uh, we also find that leadership positively influences this form of resilience. So transformational leadership and quality of communication by the principal enhances all three forms of resilience. Quick summary of these results. Um, the teachers use various possibilities to reach their pupils, to communicate, communicate with their pupils, but also to communicate with their colleagues. We only find slight changes in the work demands and work resources that are all right, I think. <laughs> um, and we find that participative transformational leadership and health awareness increase well-being. On the other hand, transformational leadership and high quality of communication also can increase the school resilience. You might ask, what should I do now with these results? We would say as a teacher, it's important to take part in workshops on online learning if they are offered. But if they are not offered, you also can use all information that is available online. Many le learning platforms have introductory videos on how to use them properly, use the resources that are available in this area. Um, but also stay in contact with your colleagues. Um, although you might be in remote teaching, try to stay in contact with them, give them social support, talk about your difficulties and the struggles you experience, and the same also holds, holds for principals. Talk with your principal regularly, tell them what you struggle with, and try to develop some solutions for this together. Moreover, do not forget that your pupils need regular contact with you, so be approachable if they have questions or difficulties with the learning material you give them. As a principal, um, the most important point is communication. This is key to reduce the uncertainty this crisis poses on us. Um, one of, it's one of the most important factors during the crisis. Communicate as much as possible with your teachers. Ask them um, how they are holding up, what difficulties they have to face, and how you might support them. These new circumstances also ask for new rules and procedures so um, these rules and procedures can reduce also the uncertainty teachers are experiencing. Ideally, you develop them together with the teachers at your school and care about the well-being of your staff. Be aware of their health and um, the stress they are under. Try to convey that the health of teachers is important to you and does not need to be sacrificed in order to deliver good lessons to pupils. So thank you for your attention. Um, I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Miriam, for your uh, very insightful presentation, very inspiring presentation. 
um, it was really interesting to see how you made that switch also to looking at the schools themselves. And um, I think we will come back to questions on your input also at the end of today's uh, webinar when we're trying to pull together different questions from the audience so that we can all engage with those questions. Um, in our presentation now, we are now switching from an international context from Australia and Germany to become a more um, local um, and look at the South African context in particular. And I'm very much looking forward to our next presenter, Professor Leslie Wood, um, and her presentation, which will um, bring us from a global view now to a very local view in South Africa. Um, I'm handing over to you, Professor Wood, for your presentation. Thanks. I always get caught out with the unmuting. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me today. Such a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to come from a slightly different perspective from the psychologists and perhaps about school leadership and look at and teacher wellness from a social justice perspective. Um, I do and I lead an entity called Community Based Educational Research. And that's where we work with communities in mostly educational contexts because we are a faculty of education um, and we draw on their lived experiences and their expertise and their local knowledge and work together to address um, pressing social issues. So it's very much about um, social justice within educational settings. Um, yeah, so as we know, the teachers I'm just trying to move this on. It doesn't seem to want to go. How do I move my PowerPoint? There we go. Um, um, teachers, so we're going to talk about that. And, and then I, I want to look at um, what effect COVID-19 is having on the situation um, and then suggest some ways how we can support teacher wellness through an integrated um, whole school approach. Um, I proceed from the viewpoint that teachers are the, are the heart of the school. And if teacher wellness is low, then the whole, the whole schooling project is negatively affected. Um, but I think teacher well-being is often a neglected component in the system. The focus of the department remains on um, the, the learner performance. And so teaching is a focus rather than, than teachers, unfortunately. And yet we know how vital, enthusiastic and motivated teachers are for the provision of quality education. So if we can enhance the attributes and strengths of teachers, um, that will have a positive impact on teacher performance, commitment, satisfaction and ultimately learner performance. So in this presentation, I want to make two main points. First, that the teacher wellness or the look of it in South Africa and I'm talking about under-resourced schools, at the township and rural schools. We have a picture of one is working quite well. Um, it's not an individual problem. But it's a consequence of systemic failures that result in social injustice. And then my second point is any initiative to improve teacher wellness must be an integral part of whole school improvement to be sustainable. So um, let me move it on. I'm not sure why this, there we go. <laughs> um, so first of all, let me, let me tell you how I understand social justice because it's um, quite a contested um, concept in many ways. Um, most definitions of the concept of social justice include ideas of equity and fairness, but how these concepts are interpreted depend upon who is defining them, on what position of power. What I think is fair, you may not think is fair. Um, from my perspective, as a privileged social um, science researcher, um, I understand that social justice is experienced by people when they're able to make choices that allow them to live their lives with dignity, a sense of agency, and hope. And there are two main paradigms to look at social justice. The first is uh, distributive justice. Um, distribution of goods and services in a, in a society and people's access to them. And when you look at the schooling system in South Africa at the moment in township and rural schools, we can see that that is kind of missing. There are a lot of people struggling 
um, with with no very little resources. So equality of access is actually an illusive vision. In reality, there's a large gap between what should be an, an ideal and practice. And then the other paradigm to look at is um, the recognition paradigm of social justice. And that relates to how people of a particular group are represented as members of the group so that they develop a positive sense of identity and a sense of um, belonging. And again, if we look at um, teachers in South Africa at the moment, they're often vilified in the press, for instance, they're often blamed for the uh, what is going on in the educational system. So the um, sense of recognition, social justice is not really there. Um, and although there are wonderful policies and systems in place to promote access to services and to enable recognition of the rights of all, how social justice is actually enacted is dependent on how free individuals are to make the choices to improve the subjective well-being. So government action um, to promote social justice is only effective when people feel they have the capability to live a life of dignity. And this is um, the essence of um, sensibility theory. But I want to look at um, yeah, wellness as fairness, uh, as Isaac Prilotensky um, posits it. Um, so here we have optimal, when, when we have optimal conditions of justice, if you think of a very well-resourced school, for example, where everybody has everything they need to, to do quality teaching, good management, etc., then people can, teachers can thrive. Um, they can um, take action to prevent any threats that come. They're very much able to control their own professional life. Not to say they don't have stress and so on, um, but a lot of the stress is perhaps um, from personal reasons or it's not so much caused by the school system they're working in. Um, and then you move down to suboptimal conditions of justice where things are, maybe something is just not going that well, some resources are missing. And then people move down from thriving to coping. And there they have to develop resilience and adaptation, and that's not a bad thing. Um, you know, we, we have to face stress in order to be resilient. But when you have a vulnerable conditions of injustice, and I would say COVID-19 crisis is that. It's a temporary um, condition that makes, well, we hope it's temporary, that make people feel um, vulnerable. Um, that can, that's also, um, a way to spur people into action. As we see now, they're, they're having these critical experiences and thinking about them and taking action. How can we address this? And teachers are doing wonderful things. I mean, they are just being forced to redo their teaching and their plans overnight to try and go online. Um, in most of the schools in rural and township areas, that's not been possible, um, but they're finding other ways to communicate with the learners. And that's the level of wellness there, according to Pilotensky, is confronting. And then, um, but if it's consistent conditions of injustice, then teachers start to suffer. And I think that's what's happening in our schools most of the time, um, in many of them. There are schools that are coping well, even with few resources, but the majority of teachers, I think, in rural areas, from the research that myself and my students have been doing and my colleagues, they are suffering. And then that leads to oppression, internalization of stress and so on, and feelings of hopelessness. And as we say, you can't have social justice if there's a lack of dignity, um, which is not there, or a lack of hope. So that is what Phil Opensky has to say about that. And I also conceive, let me just talk about how I see um, wellness from a positive psychology standpoint emphasizing the strengths and the quality of life but, and existing resources that teachers have, um, rather from a deficit perspective of trying to improve weaknesses. And of course, weakness, um, wellness is also viewed on an individual, relational and collective level, as we've heard from the other speakers. Let's move this on again. Okay, so what I did was I asked, when I was invited to do the seminar, I asked some of my graduate students who are working in rural areas in primary and secondary schools to take the three questions which you were sent and um, just go and find out very informally with their, with their colleagues what they're you know what they were feeling 
So if we, I want to share some of the responses here to see how COVID is impacting on them. Um, so physically, um, we know our teaching body is aging, especially in township and rural concepts. And there's high, uh, lots of teachers suffering from um, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, HIV, um, and some of the core morbid conditions that teachers live with da daily are just, it's just being made worse by, uh, worse by COVID. Um, many teachers can't return to the schools because of these conditions. So the burden is falling on the younger, perhaps, and more healthy teachers to take on that strain as well. Um, the PPEs, the protective equipment provided are not optimal. They say that the face mask causes breathing problems for some teachers, they don't wear the masks. Um, the shields cause headaches if they're too tight. They're also reporting exhaustion because they're having to teach the same class more than once. Um, they're having to come to school early to do the screening and so on. So physically they are exhausted. And of course all these things, um, all these aspects of holistic wellness are um, interrelated. Um, another aspect that teachers I have found in my research I always stress that affects their wellness is financial worries. This seems to be an ongoing thing. Teachers are supporting because they have a um, steady job, they're supporting extended families. So it's a huge issue. And it's only, of course, made worse now as their family members and other people they're, they're looking after lose income due to the pandemic. And of course, this affects their emotional wellness. Um, they, they worry about infection, they worry about learners not keeping their masks on. Um, they don't know what, what the learners are doing when, before they come to school. One teacher says it causes panic and nerves. We have to work during a stressful period. Um, also, a lot of work needs to be caught up that was missed. This puts pressure on the teachers, causes feelings of frustration, demoralization, not knowing what will happen tomorrow. Um, other feelings include distress, anxiety, confusion, feelings of powerlessness. I think many teachers felt like this before COVID anyway, in these conditions. Their sense of self-efficacy of teachers is negatively affected. They have to take extra caution every time, emphasizing that learners do the same. It's very stressful for them. Um, one said, adapting to different teaching strategies that are safe, ensuring that teaching and learning still takes place. Um, primary school teachers, the uh, kids are dependent on the teacher's facial expression. If she's wearing a mask, they can't see it. They, uh, they have to be up close and personal to the little ones um, and they have to sit down close to them. They can't do that anymore. Um, and remote teaching, I won't even go into that. Most of them, it hasn't been possible. Um, relational wellness. Some teachers are refusing to teach grades. The ones that can come back to school are saying, well, I'm not teaching grade 12 because I'm only a grade seven or eight teacher and that's causing stress. Pre-COVID times, sounds, <laughs> and relational wellness has, has been a problem in South African schools for a while because of the, the, the stress and the strains and the feelings of hopelessness that teachers are facing. And they tend to compete with each other, not collaborate. That's what we found. One of my PhD students, Maiti Matikatela, found that they covered up for each other. And her study really exposed the harshness of some teachers. Their lack of wellness is so low themselves, they take it up from the learners. We saw that that one learner was sent home for not having a mask on. So teachers become desensitized and we know what happened to her. Um, harsh. Um, and, and often they become the problem rather than the solution. So COVID has really just made a bad situation worse there. Um, and, and related then to the collective wellness or the organizational wellness of the school. Um, so far the response from government has been to address the physical safety, which I suppose it has been for so long. Um, but schools as a whole were not well before COVID. Bad management, teachers not in class, absenteeism, we, we know all of this. Um, so even now, um, during this vulnerable time, the focus is on physical and not mental health of teachers. Um, but the pos there are positives. The department has come to the party. Um, and, uh, I think the next slide. Okay, with flushing toilets, which schools didn't have before, some of them, cleaner schools, 
smaller classes, which the teachers love, but at the same time, that's offset by the fact of having to teach the same class for a few times. Mobile classrooms have been provided. So th th that is really good. But I, I believe that temporary infrastructure and physical health is not enough to, to su support this. So, um, so how do we address the oppression, helplessness, raise awareness so that teachers can move from suffering to confronting this, to move up to coping, and hopefully move up to thriving at some time in, in the future? Um, there we go. So my response is that we have to start from within. We do community-based research. We work with people. We go in, we you know, form partnerships with schools. Um, and, and, and use an action learning approach. We actually use participatory action research with action learning in the middle. So we call it participatory action learning and action research. We're small groups of stakeholders. And it's not just those in the school. You have to include the parents. You have to include community members. They work together to identify issues that negatively impact on, on, on teaching and learning the function of the school. And if you improve it there, you're going to improve teacher wellness in the long run. And so they develop plans to address these issues. Um, they implement, evaluate. But the, the, the main point is within the small groups, they develop strong relationships. We talked about, well, um, I think, Anja, I have a slide that didn't go back to it about the PERMA and Sigmund's outcomes there. They develop positive relationships, become engaged um, in what they're doing. Um, they, their emotions then are more positive and to get meaning and a sense of achievement because they're working together in small groups to actually improve perhaps the group of foundation based teachers how can we improve our teaching and so on so the wellness comes as a byproduct as they're working to improve social justice on conditions within the school and then of course you also have collaboration between the different groups so that they're not working in silos the most important thing is that it's grounded in values that enhance social justice such as love. Love is, is not mentioned much in academia, but um, we have to have, have, have love in our schools, care, democracy, participation. And, and we, have, we have to start with where people are. So um, in some, okay, some examples, I've just, I just copied something here, but uh, my, I've been working with a wonderful group of students and colleagues who are doing great work. And you start where you can. Some people like uh, LCB vessels have started with teachers and working in small groups. And you find when you start working in one small group, and they start experiencing better wellness and, and, and doing things in the school, others want to join in. And my Iti Tela doctor, she, um, she started with the, the learners because the school, she couldn't start with the teachers' relations were so bad. And that just started when the learners went out and said, this is how we feel. This is how this school and what's happening here is impacting on our well-being and, and our you know, sense of belonging to the school. And once the learners shared that, then it started the snowball effect. Um, and, and said Larry also worked with, Rubina also worked with um, teachers. Bruce Stammons worked down in um, Nelson Mandela University. He, he was a school principal and he, he used the Palar approach to turn his school around um, and to improve um, all aspects of wellness within the school. And now he's leading the, well, the Center for the Community School and, and they work with um, schools in rural and township areas to, to, to really having really fantastic outcomes. So have a look at that. And then there's Anti Kitching. Um, who, who, who's still in Comba. Um, she is on the Western Cape now and um, working in schools to facilitate holistic well-being. Working with school uh, teams of teachers, setting up wellness teams in schools, using a parallel approach where they don't just react to crisis, but they actually work proactively to get everybody involved in improving wellness within the school. I don't have time to go into how Palo works in detail, but um, there is there are books and lots of stuff on it um, if you want to have, have a look. So that is my input for today. Thank you again for letting me share. Um, yeah, and so that's it. So I will stop sharing my screen now. Oh, we're having to learn to do lots of things in this crisis. 
Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation and for sharing this with us. It's very insightful and gave us a good um, dive into the, what we are actually looking into when we are speaking about South Africa now in particular. And I think the next few presenters that we have will um, echo some of what you have said from their personal experience. And uh, we will now be uh, moving over to Mr. Mbluli, who is a principal at a technical high school. And he will share some of his um, experiences um, of his own, but also his staff well-being under the conditions of COVID-19. So thank you, Professor Wood. We are now moving to Mr. Mbluli, a principal in the school, who can share some additional uh, views from his side. Thank you, Chairperson, and good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to have been afforded the honor of presenting the webinar whose theme is Teacher Wellbeing Coping Mechanisms to Deal with the Consequences of COVID-19 Pandemic. Thank you for taking time out and being here today. I have titled my presentation, Teacher and Learner Wellbeing, Navigating the Complex Maze of Uncertainty and Hope. As you may already be aware, my name is Mr. Ndavente Terim Juli, a principal at a secondary school at Nkomoazini Technical High School in Utugel, in Escort. I'm a PhD student at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. My interest in this PhD is teacher job demands, emotion regulation, and teacher well -being. My input today, however, is a reflection on my experiences in basic education concerning teaching and learning within the context of COVID-19 outbreak. Besides, I'm, I will also be reflecting uh, on issues relating to teacher emotionality, COVID-19 as a matter of compliance with safety rules and regulations and its impact on teacher well-being. Managing a school within the COVID-19 context has been a daunting and sometimes con confusing and disempowering responsibility. The outbreak of the novel coronavirus resulted in a lockdown and to an expectation uh, to switch to remote teaching and learning without any foundation. First and foremost, this was without foundations in the sense that migrating to remote uh, teaching and learning was conceived as a, as a technical exercise that would require devices and access to data rather than a pedagogic endeavor that would need teachers, learners, and parents to possess new ways of transacting and engaging. In other words, uh, it uh, basically assumed a transition that was almost impossible and somewhat foreign uh, given the history of the education system in South Africa. For example, teachers and learners and parents had not been prepared for engaging productively and, for, uh, and with participating effectively in remote teaching and learning processes. <clears throat> Secondly, the narrative of uh, visual learning and teaching conveniently forgot about the weight our past has put on the shoulders of, of, of those who, as a consequence of our history of inequality and inequity, still have no access to what constitutes the daily experiences of the wealthier sections of our society. For instance, significant proportions of rural communities still don't have access to a device. Data is very expensive, unaffordable. And where they have access to these, there is no connectivity. Like today, I've struggled a lot with connectivity. I had to go to the nearby town. And uh, even those who are having devices, devices are not compatible with the task at hand. This painful oblivion on the part of, of those who must remember this reality is evidenced by the excessive emphasis on materials posted in the website of the National Department of Education and also on the website of the Provincial Department of Education here in KZN. And uh, there is no explicit explanation or mention of the alternative ways of accessing the same materials where access to online resources is utopian. In line with this narrative of oblivion, 
the emotional cost of being left out or of being unable to bridge the, 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 the transactional distance is unimaginable. To act as partner in works as a school, as much as we wanted to ensure access, we didn't know which learners had had access or had studied during lockdown, as there were no mechanisms to communicate with them during the time they were away from school. As we were not afforded the time to plan, we just quickly closed to schools and then we were told to just leave. And we did not expect uh, schools to be closed for such an extended period of time. Also, the possibility of teaching and learning while um, under lockdown and fearing to be infected was more utopian than feasible. Our known ways of uh, transacting with our learners were fighting for its life. And uh, I have, as I have pointed out earlier, the situation required a new set of pedagogical and emotional devices, which we unfortunately did not have at the time. Besides, the timing was just plain inappropriate. What we all had as the lowest common factor as teachers, learners and parents, and probably communities, um, was a state of anxiety, uh, uncertainty, fear, and isolation. For our school, remote teaching and learning was impossible to was an impossible goal to achieve or dream to achieve. Even thinking about it would be a step on our well-being. When our school reopened um, for grade 12 during level three in the middle of May, the atmosphere was quite different compared to when we closed for term one. For instance, uh, during the closure of the school, burglaries had occurred. The, depart the department had not delivered the required infrastructure. There were new measures and regulations to comply with, and teachers and learners looked like they were being transferred from one jail, which is home, to another call to school. Most of them looked overwhelmed, confused in mask, um, not knowing who is who, no energy and passion that usually characterizes our, our times of uh, of uh, reopening school. I felt that the situation was further draining emotionally. As a school principal, I knew that I had to create an emotionally stimulating environment for teachers and learners, but I was so emotionally drained that I did not have power left in me most of the time. I remember reciting words I know, trying to clear, I mean, to cheer up teachers and learners. They knew me well not to believe into my uh, I mean, not to believe into my reputation. The situation we were facing was too difficult for us to create a new imagination. As a principal, I always try to show a brave face, which I did on this day as well. However, to be exact, I was suppressing plenty of uh, negative feelings, projecting them as positive emotions, faking emotions is cumbersome and is very exhausting. And literature says it may lead to burnout. However, one positive thing though was that as teachers, we were happy to be back at school to do what we love doing, which is to teach children. But the sad thing is that we were not sure how to do it. We knew that uh, fears, anxieties, and frustrations were incompatible with proper teaching and learning. As our situation was not about uh, to change and has not changed since then, uh, we realized that we needed to deal with our challenges and adapt to our new circumstances or to our new normal. For instance, the pedagogical practices such as group work and cooperative learning have just been rendered obsolete due to the requirement of physical and social distancing. There, were, there was no mechanism for, uh, for cooperative learning within a context of staying far apart from each other. And this demise of cooperative learning undermined a great deal of what we know to be the best pedagogical practice. And it threw us back into what we had abandoned as obsolete. Also, 
extra tuition for learners who require more time is no longer happening. As teachers' workload is too high to accommodate space for additional lessons. Teachers are already complaining about being tired, uh, emotional exhaustion, and they sometimes tell me, some of them, they, they, they say they are emotionally drained. Teachers with comorbidities and those who are 60 years and above have not been substituted as previously promised by the Provincial Department of Education. Whereas even those on maternity leave are not substituted. There are cases like that in my school. The provincial department has put a moratorium in making any appointments. This moratorium is happening at a time when the teacher learner ratio is supposed to be one is to 20 with the application of physical and social distancing requirements. This means that more teachers are now required than ever before to absorb the, a, a, an increase in teacher workload. This increase in teacher workload has caused, has caused the challenges and made it timetabling challenging to implement. The difficulty of teacher workload and timetabling um, has uh, exacerbated as more cohorts of learners return to school as per the department's uh, staggered approach. These mind-bending challenges that we are basically facing in schools have taken a toll on teachers' emotions. And if not monitored, are likely to explode the emotional ceiling of teacher well-being resulting in compromised work ethic and apathy. Uh, learners have also felt this emotional weight on their shoulders as well. Learners are not an exception in this. For instance, one day I was talking to grade 12 learners. They seemed worried and asked a question about the whereabouts and health status of a teacher who was no longer coming to school due to comorbidity. They also asked about extracurricular activities, the planned excursions and, and metrics. I had to break the sad news to them that those activities are officially canceled. The response from one of the learners was that um, our metric here obviously is cast and we can't do anything. Assisting a learner to think positively about such a negative experience can be a complicated task. It basically demonstrates um, the fact that although saving the academic year and keeping safe may be significant issues for us. This must not happen at the expense of teacher and learner well-being. Our well-being is a foundation for all teaching and learning. And learning and teaching that has no foundation is more like a futile exercise. The historical neglect and uh, inadequate uh, resourcing of mechanisms for so psychosocial support and emotional well-being will be the keystone of any effort to resume teaching and learning. Unfortunately, teachers and learners' well-being is likely to be, uh, and is being eroded, in fact, by members of our families, either testing positive or dying of the COVID-19. The fact that the system is struggling to currently signals the fact that the measures and mechanisms to ensure the well-being of teachers and learners are likely to collapse as well as we approach the peak of the, of the, pandemic, of the pandemic later this month and sometime next month, as projections uh, tell us. Also, the support systems that exist at home for learners are, in many instances, destined to collapse, uh, given the inadequate delivery of essential services and high levels of vulnerabilities, of vulnerability within many of our communities. In other words, um, the emotional load weighing on our shoulders as principals, teachers, learners, and parents is likely to erode uh, uh, further the foundations required for access to effective teaching and learning. The uncertainty about how our learners will be accommodated under the new norm or under these uh, circumstances raises more questions than answers. Although there are opportunities brought about by the current situation, the resources we have, unfortunately, are mostly inadequate for crafting solutions for a new normal and taking advantages of the opportunities provided by this pandemic. 
However, um, my conclusion would be for, for our own sake and that of our learners, we have to be optimistic that things will eventually fall into place. Thank you so much, Chairperson. Thank you so much um, for your presentation and for sharing these thoughts with us. And I just wanted to also share with you that I had been monitoring our question and answer um, um, a blog and our chat while you were speaking, just to tell you um, how many voices you got that actually uh, um, are with you and that um, share your experiences and want to express their compassion with you just as a feedback while we are still in the webinar. And we will address some of the questions that were also related to your talk later in our Q&A session. So thank you so much for this eloquent um, and insightful input. And um, with that, I would like to move on to our next presenter, um, Mrs. Nompumilelo Nzimande, who is a teacher at a primary school. And we will also hear from her experience. Now we are moving from hearing from a principal to hearing from a teacher who is um, living um, teaching under COVID-19 conditions every day. Thank you so much, Mr. Mpluli. We are now moving to our next presenter. The stage is yours. Uh, greetings, everybody. Thank you for hearing me. Um, I'm Numpumele Lundzimande, as I have been introduced, and I am a primary school teacher, which means that I'm at the center of everything. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has um, affected us in one way or the other. And we all have um, different experiences when it comes to um, the pandemic. Um, I'll be sharing my experiences related to the education field and what I've seen so far, as well as the coping mechanisms that I use as, the, as a teacher. Uh, first, let, let me talk about my personal experiences um, first when this whole thing uh, began. Uh, most, most, I, mostly, I was anxious. I didn't know where I was going to start, how we were going to do it. Looking at um, our background, both teachers' backgrounds and the learners' backgrounds, because sometimes it helps to look at your personal background also, not just the learners' backgrounds. So looking at my background, I come from a relatively large family. So thinking about remote learning, I knew that I would have a lot of disruptions, a lot of um, things that I have to focus on at home. So it, it leaves me um, deciding on when I can be able to engage with my learners and when I can't because uh, there's home disruptions, as I said. Uh, it's different from being at school because at school you know that you have a focus. You're at school at 7 a.m. until half past two or three, the latest. So it gives you a focus that you know that I'm at work, I'm focusing on schoolwork. But when you're at home, there's a lot of home um, disruptions. And also what caused anxiety the most is thinking of interaction because as teachers, uh, we work most with interaction. Even when you are teaching in the classroom, uh, you mostly uh, depend on the interactions on how well they understood the topic that you are teaching. So that was worrying the most because you also had to think about learners' background. What kind of um, remote learning are you going to offer to the learners? So with that said, I'll also be living, lo moving on to the learner background. Uh, in my school, I have a mix. We have a mix of learners. Learners that come from advantaged background and disadvantaged background. So there we are looking at um, financial support or financial opportunities. So that's what was worrying the most that, okay, we're gonna have learners that are gonna be part of the remote learning and learners that are not gonna be part of the remote learning. So how will that go about? Uh, but it helped that we had a, a very supportive community because when you find learners that are able to be part of remote learning, they were able to share with learners that are not if they are close by. So having a support, supportive community helped a lot. Um, in terms of the remote learning um, with the learners, there were issues of having no gadgets. Um, so you only relied on those learners that had gadgets. And also you had gadgets that belonged to parents. 
So if the parent was an essential worker and came back at six, that would mean that the learners who weren't able to access the lesson during the day would have missed out unless you worked on things such as WhatsApp groups of which they can just go back and read through and see what was happening through the day. But it wouldn't be the same because during the day there was some kind of interaction. Um, also, the internet access issue. Uh, having gadgets doesn't mean that you're going to be able to be part of the lesson. We have internet access issues whereby data costs money and learners that come from disadvantaged background would have a financial situation where they can't uh, access data so they can't be part of the lessons and also some cannot some devices cannot access apps that we wanted to use for remote learning for example um having to stream the lesson on zoom some can't um, access those apps so that would be a problem and also in terms of assessments it's not easy to assess uh, via remote learning because it's not the true reflection of the learners you might find that the learner was being helped by someone at home so you'd be like okay i know that this learner um, is at this level so how come so that will tell you that uh, assessment was not um, truly done it was not a true ref reflection of the learners and also practical activities uh, as you saw in my bio i also teach um, natural sciences so Natural sciences re requires a lot of practical activities. So having to do that whole at home was not easy because most of the required resources are, are at school. So now you have to think of ways on how you're going to do the practical activities. Uh, so sometimes you end up not doing them. So which um, falls back on the curriculum coverage. And also with the learners as well, they had home disruptions issues because uh, you find that in their families, not everybody understands what the, what they are going through and how they are trying to engage in teaching and learning. So it, it, re it wouldn't matter that they are in a lesson. So they would just call them or ask them to do chores. So that was um, the home disruptions that I experienced from the learners. And then moving on to returning to contact teaching, uh, it was... Um, a bit of an issue and very stressful because now we had to look at issues such as classroom setting and before we had a large number of learners in the classroom which is about which is about 42 learners so you had about um two classes of one of one grade in each grade now having to adhere to the COVID 19 regulations um you had to have about to have about 20 learners in the classroom so now it splits the classes from two up to four, which means there's more workload for the teachers. So meaning that a lesson that you teach in classroom one, you have to teach in classroom two up to classroom four. And knowing that we did not have any addition of teachers, we have to work with the teachers within the school. So there's no multiplication that you can do. It means that the teachers that are teaching the, those particular subjects have to go through all the four classes because uh, I heard um, Mr. Davinsky mentioning the thing with having to ask teachers from the foundation phase to come and help in the intermediate phase. Some were not willing because it's not something that they're used to or they're not qualified to teach in that particular phase. So it would be an issue. So you'd have to end up using the same teachers that were teaching in the intermediate phase and then have to go through all this classroom, which is very stressful which causes um, burnout, stress, teachers uh, go home tired. And it does not reflect your teaching because by the time you get to the fourth class, you're already tired and it's not gonna be the same as what you had done in the first class. So which means that the last class would be at a disadvantage because you're not um, giving your full energy as the first class because by the time you get to the fourth one, uh, you are very tired. And also compliance. Um, learners are not used to the new norm. So at first we had a problem of learners not complying. They don't understand that, that, that the, the importance of the matter and that they have to adhere to these regulations. They just wanna go on as it was before. So having to teach them and emphasize compliance, uh, having to ask them to wear their mask, uh, sanitize now and again, wash your hands. It was a bit of an issue at first because 
it's not the, what they're used to, but as time went on, they started um, understanding and complying. So it helps to always emphasize on the COVID-19 regulations as a teacher when you walk into the classroom. And my feelings personally, I was very overwhelmed because um, of the number of subjects that I teach. Having to teach three subjects and going through four classes, uh, which means that um, a day I'd have about 12 um, lessons. So it was quite overwhelming. Also having to try and meet the um, cur curriculum coverage uh, for all these subjects. Uh, I have to have a plan because all these learners have to be taught. They just can't come to school and sit there at just because I am just overwhelmed and tired, I'm not gonna teach. I'm at school, so I have to do my duty as a teacher, no matter what. Uh, also, the anxiety and health, health issues. Uh, when you are stressed and uh, have a feeling of burnout, uh, you, you also attract a lot of health issues. When you feel tired, your immune system is not functioning as well as it should. It should, because you you're now tired, your body you're exhausted. So things such as flu, you catch them very easily. So health um, was my main concern um, when moving back to con contact teaching. However, um, it it helped to gradually adjust and think of uh, possible solutions and how I can go about it. Because I, I, I didn't really rely on getting information from the department because uh, context uh, matters in the situation. They might, they might be um, a standard approach, but the context might be different. So when you get to your particular context, it helps to just look at how can I go about, what can I do personally, uh, before looking at the standard operating procedures that have been presented to us. And also resources. Uh, we come, I, well, I come from a school that is, I, can, I cannot say that it's well resourced. It does have some resources, but thinking that, okay, for now we have um, grade sevens and the grade six back, but what happens when all the learners come back? Because we don't have a space. We don't have enough floor space to come accommodate all the learners. And also planning. Now you have to plan in such a way that you have to cover the entire curriculum. Also cover um, the numbers of the classrooms that, are, that you now have. So those, that's, that's where I was worried about, mo about the most when it comes to my um, feelings. However, as I said, it is to have uh, personal strategies and how you can go about. So my first strategy was ensuring that I keep healthy. Uh, I do the necessary things, eat healthy, and secondly, exercise. Um, um, I think it was um, Re Professor Rebecca who spoke about um, just switching off. Um, so when I get home, I just switch off from the working environment. I try to exercise, focusing on exercise, because as soon as I'm done, I'm more relieved and I'm, I just want to go to bed and then um, tackle the next day as it comes. And also bringing in positive energy. Uh, as a teacher, if you bring in positive energy in the classroom, learners will respond because uh, they were also stressed out as much as we are. So if you are going to come with that um, lack or negative energy, it, it won't help. So bringing in positive energy, it attracts, uh, it makes them attract that positive energy and want to learn. So I saw that working in my classroom that when I come in, I don't come in distressed. I just bring in the positive energy we really do under the normal circumstances that we had before. And also making use of the resources that are within the schools. Uh, we, As I am in the COVID-19 committee, there are resources that we have to distribute within the school so that we ensure that we adhere to the regulations. So making use of these resources such as sanitizing and putting on your gloves uh, makes you at ease for that particular moment because you know that, okay, at least I'm protected. And also, as I said that before, um, we moved from having four classes to two classes. So the um, strategy that I, I used was to alternate lessons. So today I teach one, one topic to two class, 
and choose a different topic to the other two classes. And then the following day, move back to the uh, topic that I taught the first two classes, teach it to the other two classes. So it helped me in such a way that I don't have to repeat myself the entire day and be emotionally exhausted. And also um, support from the SMT, which uh, also gears towards communication. It's very important to communicate because as much as we rely on the SMT, they also need to know what we are thinking and um, how, how can we go about in tackling the situations because we are within the classroom and we see the situation. So if we communicate with them and tell them what's going on and what we need, what form of support do we need, it makes it easier to go about. And also it helps to be optimistic about situations, uh, having hope, hope that the situation will change and also not leave out the learners. It helps to have learner interaction during this time because you also get their feelings. Um, you get to understand what they're feeling about the situation and that helps you devise strategies of how to go about when conducting lessons because you now know their feelings and what they are able to do and what they are able to cope with currently. And also choosing a program that works. For example, we're given a set of programs that we must choose which was the bi-weekly, um, the alternative days. Um, so in those programs, you choose the one that works with your school. So in our school, we chose alternative days because we saw that using alternative days is much better than using bi-weekly because we have uh, foundation-based learners. If we choose bi-weekly, by, by the time they come back the other week, then maybe they would have forgotten what they learned in the other two weeks so alternative dates works much better because it's just a one day in between so when they come back you can just uh, continue from where you stop and they'll be able to understand and then lastly um, it helps also look at um, potentially positive aspects from this entire situation um, with the learners um, before you found that in context teaching you teach and then maybe not complete the lesson or not finish the lesson so now having two methods having to teach remote remotely and having context teaching it helps because now you can always go back to one of those groups that we use for remote learning and then put the work there so that learners will be able to complete or revise so it makes it easier for them when it comes to um, doing assessments. And also with us as teachers having to use um, new strategies. Um, these strategies may, may, may help us ongoing and also help us cover the curriculum. Uh, because before we did have issues of not being able to cover the curriculum. So now that we are we are in, if I can put it this way, we, we are under pressure to, to for the curriculum coverage, complete the, the curriculum. Now it will help us use the same strategies when things are back to normal. It'll help us use the same strategies to be able to cover the curriculum so that we don't have issues of not completing the, the syllabus. And also with the learners, again, uh, now that they understand compliance and what, what it, it entails, moving forward, we might not have a lot of um, discipline issues because we, and that we, as we had to enforce this compliance to them, they are gradually adjusting to it. So when it goes back to normal, hopefully, um, they'll be able to be more disciplined than before. So that's the hope that we have. And also with our well-being as teachers, it will help us focus more on our well-being when um, on, ongoing moving forward it will help us focus more on our well-being not that before we weren't focused on it because but now we know the importance of our well-being so it will help us um, focus more on it and um, also resources as we are going through the situation we are we keep asking for resources we so having resources moving forward will help us because before we had a problem of lack of resources. So if we get the required resources now, 
it means that moving forward, we can make use of these resources that we have now. So I think that's a positive uh, part about it. So um, that is all about our presentation today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so very much for your input. You are the living example of optimism and resilience in these times. Thank you for sharing that with us. And when I was monitoring the chat in our question and answer box, I also experienced that you are inspiring others and a lot of other people in the chat relate to what you have been presenting. So it's very important to actually hear from, from you, for example, what works for you. Now that we move into our question and answer session, I would also like to encourage the other presenters today to just check in the Q&A box. Maybe there's something they would also like to respond to individually by typing some responses in there. Because I have seen that we got quite a number of um, comments and quite a number of questions um, that uh, relate to our topic today. So if you, please feel free to also go into this Q&A box and type some responses if you like. For our overall question and answer session, I would like to highlight a few aspects that I have picked up from the chat and from the Q&A. And uh, first of all, I would like to um, come up to or, or, or relate the first question to a comparison. Because I noticed something in uh, Miriam Arnold's presentation, where she actually spoke about the situation in Germany. And she observed that for teachers, the actual situation did not change that as tremendously. And you even found results showing that emotional demands and role um, clarity had changed, uh, but rather in a favorable, um, 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 yeah, favorable direction. So my first aspect of this question is to ask Miriam to share some, of, I, some ideas why this may have happened. And the second part of the question then goes to other panelists in terms of and how would you compare the situation in South Africa to what Miriam has been presenting in Germany. So first part of the question, Miriam, if you could please share some thoughts with us on why you think you found that particular result. Yeah, thank you for this interesting question. It's rather difficult to interpret those findings, I find. Um, I think concerning the emotional demands, we asked if um, teachers had to hide their feelings or show feelings that are not present as, for example, being serious or strict towards a student, although he or she did something funny. Um, so I think these are demands that are not that present in remote teaching. It's rather if you are in a classroom with the students, uh, you need to tone down your emotions or sh show emotions that you don't actually have. On the other hand, uh, the results on decreasing world conflict, I have few ideas how this um, yeah, is happening because um, I expected to be there to be more world conflict, um, but somehow it seems to get clearer what are the um, work demands. Um, I, I don't know, maybe some some other um, people in the panel have some ideas on that. I think, Miriam, that's a good example for how much we also need to learn about how teachers um, 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 yeah, experience their work life through COVID-19. And some things may puzzle us, like this, for example. My personal idea would be that maybe it also has to do with this reduced not reduced workload, that's not the, that's what I'm saying about, but um, very, teachers are very much thrown into this um, role of having to teach online. Other aspects like organizing things within a school may have at first been less prominent um, and are, have only picked up later again. Um, so just an hypothesis from my side, uh, but um, it's a good expression to see how much we also still need to learn about the situation and uh, what other interesting research and what interesting thoughts your research has triggered. So thank you so much for sharing this. And in my second part of the question, I would actually like to um, ask the other panelists here um, from South Africa what they think um, what the situation in South Africa is in comparison to what Miriam had presented from Germany and what you would like to highlight in this regard. And um, um, 
I can see that um, Leslie looks like she has something to share on this. So Professor Wood, please go ahead and maybe you have some insights or some comments that you would well, like to you, share with us on this. I think we're starting from different um, starting blocks, if you like. Um, teaching in Germany is a very well respected profession. Teachers are well paid. They are mostly have to do master's degrees, at least they're trying to do that in most schools. So we're starting from very different things. And for teachers in Germany who, who you know, to adapt their teaching to online, for instance, a lot of us at university, we are actually enjoying working from home because we have the resources and it's less stressful. So I think that's, you know, that our teachers um, in, the under-resourced schools are really struggling. They're stressing about not being able to speak to the learners, um, trying to use WhatsApp and different things. But of course, I mean, even at our university, they were saying there are 2,000 students on the country floor. We just cannot find them. So imagine what, what is happening in the, in the schools as well. It's so hard to reach a learner. So I think it's, it's difficult to draw comparisons against systems that are so different. Um, but that's just my intake. Would others like to share some insights or some, uh, would I like to make some highlights here? Um, just let me know by raising your hand and I know. <laughs> it's a difficult question, I know. I was just trying to point towards some ideas of when we have these different results for research, what can we actually take from it for different contexts? And I think what I've taken from your presentations is a slightly different picture to what Miriam had presented in terms of a broader variety of challenges that teachers in South Africa are facing. And um, um, having to do with the contextual issues that Professor Wood has, had just pointed us towards. So what we're seeing here is uh, um, a lot of different aspects that uh, teachers are now confronting. And we've, we've touched upon quite a few of those um, on workload related aspects, uh, training related aspects, uh, feelings of exhaustion, um, um, having to manage so many things at the same time, uh, being disconnected from learners, an aspect that came through very strongly in the presentations and that uh, affects teachers quite a lot, but also aspects of um, personal fears and personal concerns that are out there where uh, people are just um, on the front line of something and that obviously also affects their, their well-being, um, all these concerns and all these um, fears that may be in there. And my reflection and my observation here is that um, I've picked up uh, quite a bit of that in our chat as well. So I see that we have uh, quite a good mix of people in our chat educators, people who work in education, people who also do research in education. And I think that is a quite an interesting platform that you have there. And if you haven't had a chance to look into the chat, please do so. Because it also shows you something, and that is how emotional this debate is. And the chat is a good example for that. And I think it's something that we need to address and that we need to focus on. And maybe not only in our webinar today, but also in future engagements, because it's such a vast topic and we can only address aspects of it today. But um, if we go to the questions that we have received, I also have some others that I would like to pose to our panelists. And uh, one of them was related to support. How can teachers be supported best, but also how can principals support it best? One of our, um, uh, one of the people attending the webinar today has asked if principals are supposed to support their staff and their teachers so much, where do they find the support um, that keeps them going? So two questions here again, how can we support our teachers and how can we support principals so, as first point of reference in this process? So um, some questions to the panelists and I would like to hear from those on the ground first if they have something to share about this. So maybe uh, Ms. Nziman would like to share where she gets her support from um, to stay this optimistic and resilient person that she seems to be. Okay. Um... As I mentioned in my presentation, that it helps to communicate as the teachers. 
but uh, having the proper channels of communication helps. So um, having a committee, it's much easier to go speak to them and they take the matter to the SNT as well as the, as the principal. So in the, it helps not to demand because the principal as well was, is in the same situation as us. Uh, it's not that the principal has something um, different or they have more information of how to deal with the situation. So um, getting the right support means having the right communication, what you need support in, because looking at the time we have, even the SMT cannot just go about and just think, okay, this is what we need to do because it takes a lot of time of trying to take, maybe they're trying to tackle situations that are not problematic to the teachers. So it helps to have a uh, communication. So uh, the support um, that I received from the SMT was just being trained and understanding the standard operating procedures and knowing what to do, should there be a possible case or be um, a confirmed case. So that is the kind of support that we were expecting anyways, because we, we're not expecting them to go beyond because we are in the same situation as them. So basically at first, just helping us understand the procedures and what we have to do in terms of uh, managing the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much. It seems not only emotional support, but also instrumental support, receiving the relevant knowledge and um, 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 confirmation seems to be of high relevance to add to the clarity of your role as a teacher. So linking that again to a that Miriam has found in terms of if something's well communicated and well um, presented, um, it can become much clearer what is expected to you of a teacher and that is also a form of support. And now I would like to point towards uh, the principal that we have here in our webinar. Um, who is in that position to um, provide support to others, but also sometimes need support for himself? Where do you draw that support from? What mechanisms help you in that regard? Um, I think to get support, you just have to be creative and be innovative as a principal. Uh, like, Nampomelelo has said, communicate with teachers because there is nothing standard that comes from the department. Uh, because sometimes even when uh, departmental officials come to schools, you know, they don't basically give you anything, you know, to say to teachers. Everybody is overwhelmed. So I think what can keep you going is that you talk to teachers, you devise means and strategies, but obviously those can be like contextual things, not like standard things that you can just uh, uh, tell everybody to implement. Because if a, a strategy uh, has to work, it has to be, it has to be researched upon, be tested and something like that. Whatever keeps you going, as long as you agree with teachers, as long as there is harmony for that particular moment, you just keep on carrying on work, 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 work things will just maybe fall into place, as I did mention in my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. What an example of great commitment, where you seem to draw your energy from the commitment to your school that keeps you going and the commitment to be a principal and involved in, in education. That seems to be a driver of your energy to provide that support. So thank you for pointing towards that. I also would like to point out to some other questions that we had in the um, in chat or in the um, Q&A box. And um, we had quite a variety of questions here. Some addressed um, issues of um, school infrastructure, how schools could be um, organized and how schools should be set up in order to uh, provide a good setup for learners to learn in there. And um, I just wanted to highlight that um, our focus is more on well-being and less on occupational health and safety. But there are interesting resources out there that you can look into. And there is a, a very interesting um, information pamphlet and brochure on exactly that, 
how we uh, should um, structure, how we could structure our schools and provide infrastructure. Um, from a professor at Harvard University, if you're interested in that, I'm most happy to share that link with you so that you get some insights into that. When I also look into our chat, I see some other aspects and somebody else has asked the question, how do we as teachers or teacher trainers or program coordinators manage um, to sustain teacher well-being even after the lockdown? So somebody's already pointing the way forward. What can we take from what we are learning here that might actually help sustain teacher well-being over longer periods of time? And I would like to pose that question to our panelists. And I would like to invite Professor Wood um, to maybe share some of her thoughts on this. Right. Yeah, as I, as I mentioned in my, my presentation, it's, it's a whole school approach that's needed, the whole system. We have to look at it. This is an opportunity, you know, when crisis happens, it, it forces us out of a complacency. And I mean, we put up with a, a very badly functioning school system. We have wonderful educators, principals, but being forced to work within a system, which is, is just giving so many barriers to teaching and learning and affecting the well-being of all who are working in there. Um, so we have to start looking at the help's not going to come from outside. What can each school do? So even in this time of crisis, what can we do as teachers? How can we support each other? How can the management work together? Perhaps drawing from community. Um, yeah, just looking for ways to start. How can we as a school start addressing these issues that are facing us? How can we improve our own wellness? I got something on Facebook this morning from the Western Cape where the teachers there are calling for the shutting of all schools. And they're highlighting these social justice issues. How can we carry on when this is overcrowded when we are facing this issue and that issue. And in the end, they say, the last demands, it's time to fix our schools. And I think that's a, that should be a nationwide call. But it's up to um, the teachers and the unions and everybody to, to take that call forward. Because if we just return to our normal, which is, is not normal <laughs> compared to other countries or to compare to the other systems, the well-resourced school system in our own country and that's that's not going to be helpful i think this is a time where the resilience and the creativity and the determination of our teachers can come to the fore through working together and, and and partnering with other people who who, who can help them with, um, to do so that's my Thank you so very much for sharing this. I think this is a very good summary and also a summary of uh, what we need to be looking into. And it also um, highlights that what we can do here in this webinar today is just an a looking at an aspect of it. But all is highly interlinked, as Professor Wood had just pointed out. Um, we try to tackle this problem from one specific point of view. And that is to look at teacher well-being and what teachers can be supported with to do this. But obviously that links in with a lot of other aspects. And I would like to um, highlight some of that. And if you allow me to present what I had been taken from the inputs that I received from our panelists and try to tie it up and um, maybe provide a bit of an, an outlook where we could be going next with, uh, with this topic. So allow me to just look into my presentation that I had um, shared with you earlier. Remember that part here. Yeah. But um, now that I learned from all our presenters, I actually had this following idea or this following impression. We started off by looking at teacher well-being. And we looked at different aspects, the subjective experiences of well-being. We touched a bit on physical or mental well-being. Um, we focused quite a bit on social well-being in our interactions with others um, to avoid stress or burnout and to improve our well-being, motivation, um, um, well, wellness, and other aspects that we had um, talked about in the beginning. But we are not, um, or yeah, this is the kind of focus we chose for now. But there are other factors that we need to take into account. So what is the context bringing us with? What kinds of demands, what kind of resources are there in our working environment, in rural schools, in um, township schools, and other kinds of schools? That is important to look at. And you have seen some interesting um, in inputs on that. 
Um, so school characteristics play a role, but also teacher characteristics, like the optimism and resilience that was mentioned, or other aspects that um, were mentioned on um, being able to um, um, switch off and being able to find support. Um, these aspects we could be looking into. Other aspects, um, and that we only touched upon quite briefly, uh, actually relate to why we are doing this. Of course, we are worried about teacher well-being as such, but it also affects how and what kind of learning takes place. So this is something that we uh, could not focus fully on in our webinar here, and we might be looking into that at another stage, how this actually also affects how we interact with learners. And obviously, um, none of what we are talking about takes place in a vacuum. There's um, all kinds of contextual um, influence um, which Professor Wood has actually spoken about or touched up upon quite, um, quite strongly. So what you can see here is just a little summary of where I see our different presenters in this webinar today and what they have shared and what they have given us insight on. And you can see that we are trying to bring the puzzle pieces together here, but obviously one uh, webinar cannot address um, the entire topic in its complexity. So please understand that we have to focus on some aspects and I think we have been able to look into some very interesting and some very important aspects of fostering teacher well-being. And we've looked at different demands that might be out there in terms of the workload or the uncertainty related to teaching under COVID-19 conditions. Um, different presentations have highlighted the need for um, being able to adapt and the need to communicate as um, something that is important, especially under these conditions of remote learning. We also looked into emotional demands and rural conflict, which seems um, quite an interesting topic to look into and maybe also compare across contexts. Um, we should not forget about the social justice perspective that we, um, we have touched up upon on that Professor Wood has mentioned. And in the presentations and in quite a few of the presentations, you saw that it's not only about the demands that come from the context um, and that affect teachers, but we cannot forget about our principles. The presentation by Ms. Arnold and Mr. Mzluli, um have very much um, um, highlighted this topic that we should not forget the, the leadership in schools, the principles and their well-being as well. On the other hand, and now I'm trying to um, struck a slightly lighter note, is what can we actually do? What resources would be out there that we could tap into? And supporting one another is very important. Professor uh, Wood called it care earlier on. So this is something that we should keep in mind, the care that we have for one another, the support we have, but also our individual strategies of being able to regain our strengths by switching off and being mindful about how we um, invest our energy and how we engage. So mindfulness might be another topic that we would look into um, maybe in a future um, and in a future session or in future research. Leadership, again, crept up as an important resource that is out there. Autonomy, supportive leadership, other forms of leadership that different presenters have highlighted as important resources for teachers. And I would also like to highlight quickly something that um, uh, was in the presentation by Professor Wood on coping. And um, it struck me that, yes, actually, we need to rethink if coping is actually enough, if you shouldn't actually be looking for thriving um, under these, um, uh, for something for teachers. So this is a thought um, I will also carry with me out of today's webinar. So you see that we try to reflect on quite a number of topics here, but please bear with us that we could only um, look at a specific focus. And of course, there is a need for uh, further research and reflection um, to understand the situation of teacher well-being and principal well-being under COVID-19 conditions further. And um, maybe at some stage, we also find the strength to look beyond on what will come out of this um, situation and this pandemic. And maybe there is even a, a bit of light at the end of the tunnel that some aspects here can also be a catalyst for change to the better. So I try to end on this slightly lighter note because I know at the moment we are in this pandemic and I see that there, this is a very emotional debate that's held in the chat. 
but sometimes it also helps to um, try to see what might come out of it and what might, um, um, yeah, um, yeah, what changes may, may occur over time. With that, this brings us to the end of the webinar today, and I can't express um, how time flew for me. I hope it was the same for you, and I would like to um, say a few words of thanks. Of course, I would like to thank the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and in particular the College of Humanities and the DVC Professor Mkise for allowing me this opportunity to, to be here and bring together these people um, who share their insights onto the topic of teacher well-being. And it was such an honor for me to be able to do this. I was, would also like to thank the School of Education, in particular the Dean Professor Msibi, for allowing me this opportunity and for giving me the support I need um, also in doing my own work on this topic. So that I'm very grateful for this. And I would like to thank um, 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 these people that I've mentioned here for that. Another big thank you goes to corporate relations at UKZN. And in particular, Melissa Mangru and um, Shakila Tafukur Passat, who are also in the chat. Thank you so much for um, taking care of all these aspects. And there's a lot of work going into preparing such a webinar. And these two deserve a big round of applause for doing such a wonderful job in doing this. And last and certainly not least, I would like to thank the panelists for their wonderful inputs, um, for the sharing their thoughts so generously with us. Um, it was really a great pleasure to have you here and to hear from you. Thank you very much. And thank you to you as an audience in this webinar for also pouring out your thoughts and uh, emotions in the chat and for engaging so intensely with us on this topic. And um, I would like to thank you very much for that. So with that, um, I would like to um, come to the end of today's webinar. Unfortunately, it's already over, but maybe we get a chance at some stage to pick up this conversation and move forward with it, because I personally think it's a highly relevant and highly um, important topic that uh, we should be following up on. Thank you very much, everybody, and I hope you have a great evening um, and hope to see you in another webinar. And thank you for your wonderful facilitation, Anja. It was really good. Thank you. You're most welcome. It was my pleasure.